Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this virtual professional development opportunity. My name is Joe Schmidt, and I'm the Social Studies Specialist with the Maine Department of Education. Today, we will be talking about teaching the American Revolution in the elementary classroom. Our guest presenter today is Stephanie Connors. She's a fourth grade teacher at Mount Vernon Elementary School. So we're gonna be talking about social studies in the elementary class and kind of through this lens of this topic that Stephanie's currently working her way through. I also wanna give a shout out. Uh, some of you may be familiar with Moose, the DOE's Moose Project. Moose stands for Maine's Online Opportunities for Sustained Education. Uh, I've been lucky to work with Stephanie and her partner, Bethany, um, on the Maple the Moose series, a social studies centric interdisciplinary project based online module, four of them now, or three, working on four. Four, follow, yep. Follow the adventures of Maple the, Mo Maple the Moose as she works to make her community a better place. And I could not be more proud of the work that Stephanie and Bethany have been doing. So without any further ado, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Stephanie. Thank you, Joe, um, and welcome everyone. I'm so honored to be here today. And um, if you have any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat or you have any thoughts. Um, I'd like to hear from people. Um, in our, I work in RSU 38 in Marana Cook and um, in fourth grade, uh, there is at the tail end of the year, we have a big unit in reading and writing that's all about the American Revolution. And um, I'm not from Maine. I am from the DC area, from Maryland. And my grandmother was a, um, a educator. And so we spent a lot of time going around to places that we knew were historical. So the American Revolution was always kind of near and dear to my heart. And to be able to teach it has been really fun. And to be able to include all of um, the elements of social studies in our Maple, the Moose story, has been just a really rewarding, very fun um, experience. And so um, I wanted to kind of share a little bit about what um, we do in our district and just things that I've learned that have kind of elevated my teaching and some ideas and some things that maybe um, other teachers could use in their classrooms as well. So um, I'm going to move this out of the way. Um, so one of the things that uh, we do is our reading unit at the end of the year is all dedicated to the American Revolution. And I was asking myself, how might an elementary unit on the American Revolution show best social studies instructional practice? So in, um, at the elementary level, students are really learning those foundational skills that they need to engage in social inst studies instruction at the middle and high school levels. So what we're doing in fourth grade and in third grade and fifth grade are really, really important to kind of build those steps that kids need to be able to keep going. Um, so one of the things that they start really in participating in and engaging in at elementary level is the inquiry process, which is very much what we do in social studies. And for reading, they're really um, learning how to read to learn, which is a big shift when they hit third grade. Um, and just understanding the different genres of literature and how to read those. And in the American Revolution, at the elementary level, there's so many new books out there, um, historical fiction, biographies, and informational. Um, and they're one of the standards that they focus on is to how to analyze text structures. In um, our, we focus on that um, standard in our district for this unit um, and how to make sense of different perspectives. The George versus George book is a really great example of this. Um, how is it that you know, certain people have a view of this event and other people have a different view? Um, we're still working on how to summarize, how to be able to tell the main idea and supporting details within fiction and nonfiction and how to effectively discuss what you're reading with a group to be able to state your beliefs clearly and effectively while building on the ideas of others and also to increase content area vocabulary. And um, I put together this next slide that is the vocabulary that our district really focuses on for kids and it's a pretty long list. And when we start talking about the American Revolution, um, 
it's really important that kids understand these terms that are on this slide in front of you. And one resource that I use to start is the um, fact tracker from the Magic Treehouse, the American Revolution book. It's super simple. Um, you'd think that it wouldn't be great for fourth grade, but it just breaks everything down into very simple terms and describes events very simply, but still introduces a lot of this vocabulary. And I think growing up for me, I knew a lot of these things, but I know that there are a lot of kids that, that really don't. And you have to have that background knowledge in order for this to really stick. So teaching the vocabulary is super important. And I listed some ideas for vocabulary instruction that are low tech. So as you teach um, the vocabulary, you can have kids um, put them together in puzzles or word searches or crossword puzzles. There are some places where you can make your own puzzles and print them out for kids and also in word hunts. So when they're doing, um, if they're doing any independent reading um, or in book clubs and book groups, which I'll be talking about a little bit later, um, they could do word hunts, which is always good. And uh, ideas for vocabulary instruction that are high tech include um, Kahoot, Quizzes, Pear Deck, Nearpod, Google Forms, like in the form of an escape room. And also uh, one that I've just learned about recently is Boom Cards. Um, and thinking about building more background knowledge, one of the things that we've done recently is to have kids explore Google Earth. And with the world the way it is, um, kids have devices and they have access to um, Chrome, typically through either iPad or Chromebooks, depending on their age. And um, Google Earth is fantastic. So we have used Google Earth for kids to look at as we talk about um, the shot heard around the world. They can look at Minuteman National Park and see the statue of the Minuteman and the actual bridge there in, um, I want to say it's Concord, but um, it's, it's there for kids to see so that they can um, really understand what the scenarios were like. You can go to Old North Church, you can go to battlefield sites, um, and I enclosed to, these are links, so this is a link to Google Earth, how it can be used. This was a tutorial that I found on YouTube to get you started. Um, I don't know if anybody's really actually using this yet, um, but, and then here's a picture of what it might look like. And this is Bunker Hill Monument. You can um, add to a project, or if you click here on the Wikipedia, um, it can actually give you quite a bit of information about Bunker Hill, which is really cool. So I would encourage folks to check that out if they could. Um, and I wanted to talk about writing as well because when children are engaged in social studies instruction and learning, it's important not just that they develop the reading skills that they need to be able to access the material, but they need to be able to write, to communicate. So our district uses a Lucy Calkins writing units of study. And in fourth grade, at the end of the year, it's the um, bringing history to life, which is informational. Um, at this point too, where kids are moving beyond opinion writing. So in third grade, they're really focusing on organizing their thoughts and having counterclaims. But when you move through fourth grade, uh, it becomes more about thesis writing, which becomes super important when you're researching or exploring ideas related to social studies, because you're thinking about what does this mean? What did I just read? What does all of this information say? Um, and you're putting it into a big idea. And it can be challenging. And um, particularly this year, because it feels like there's really not enough time to really understand what it's like to develop thesis and to have a position or a claim, we say, and defend it. And think about counterclaims, which is one of the things that Lucy Calkins uh, writing units of study talks about is they want kids to think about what is the argument from the other side? Also adding evidence from the text to support your position, that starts to come in um, in about third and fourth grade, adding quotes, adding mini stories, um, citing your evidence, organizing your writing in a way that makes sense. So it's not just paragraphing, it's not just indenting, but it's thinking about if I make this argument here, 
and then I use my text evidence, then what point am I actually trying to make? And what would be the next point that would logically make sense after that? And that starts to come in here. And so it's, it's really, again, the foundational skills that kids need to learn to be able to communicate and express their thinking about social studies. Also starting to add punctuation to quotations, continuing to make connections to new learning, um, learning research methods becomes really big because we spend a lot of time also learning about informational reading. What are some ways that we can um, get as much as we can from the text? So when we're thinking about the text, um, how can we make meaning from it? Do we go back and reread? Do we make notes? Do we write about what we read? Um, so all of those really start to come into play and in following steps in the writing process planning, drafting, revise and edit. And, um, and that's a big piece. They learn that um, very, very early on through the Lucy Calkins units of studies. Um, so in the Lucy Calkins unit of studies in fourth grade, they pick a topic that interests them, research it and write what they think um, and learn. And so by doing that, students grow. And this year, I think it's gonna be a little bit more of a challenge to be able to get through as much of the unit as we could um, as we normally would. Um, so I'm a little disappointed in that, but we have to do what we have to do. Um, and just thinking about social study standards, history, geography, personal finance and economics and civics and government. How does the American Revolution instruction fit into those? And we know it's history that kids need to understand this and even Maine's place in it. Geography, um, one of the things that's fun to do is to show kids on Google Earth um, where England is and the Atlantic Ocean and where the colony started um, and have kids look at a map of the colonies and then create their own because understanding geography, even in fourth grade um, and where the different regions, um, why people went to different regions to colonize it's just as important as understanding the causes of the revolution, in my opinion, because people settled in New England for very different reasons than they settled um, in Virginia, for instance. And so understanding those, I think, helps kids to understand more about, you know, why different colonies may have reacted differently to the Constitutional Convention, for instance, um, as they get older. Personal finance and economics, one of the standards that we have touched on in our district is the idea of goods and services. And um, this is really, it really connects to situations, especially when you're talking about the Stamp Act and then the Intolerable Acts and the Boston Tea Party. What does that mean? What did it mean for England when um, the Sons of Liberty went in dressed as Native Americans and threw tea over the sides of the boat. What did that mean? Um, and it seems fun until you start talking about how much it was worth at the time and kids really start to understand, well, that was really, that was really serious when they did that. And so um, I think it's really important for kids to connect events in the American Revolution to these standards in particular. And civics and government, um, the American Revolution was when our country was founded and the lessons learned through having a king and fighting the war all went into how our government was created. So that was a really big basis for civics and government. And the other thing that can be really fun and um, exciting about teaching an American Revolution unit in elementary is to start with inquiry just asking kids open-ended questions and they can you know, vary based on your grade level and learning objectives. But um, one to consider was, was the revolution inevitable? Um, and get them really thinking about different things. Um, were the Tories right? Were the Patriots right? And just getting them to think beyond just getting the facts. Um, there are other things that, other questions you could ask if you're asking them to do some research about a particular person um, and they forget what they learn, then you could ask them, why is it important to take notes on what we read? Well, so it helps us to remember and to make connections as we go. 
Um, why are stories told from different perspectives? Why is it important to understand what happened from the perspective of both Georges? And why do we compare and contrast texts? And what is a productive collaborative discussion? Um, and these are some strategies, just some ideas of things on the next few slides that um, are kind of fun ideas to consider if you want to make social studies instruction a little bit more interactive. Um, I have done uh, interactive bulletin boards. We've made a map of the world before, and that was really fun. Um, and there, these were some ideas I thought would translate really well. One is to use QR codes so that they link to um, maybe a certain person or event and kids can hold their device up. This is kind of similar to a Padlet. It's really just about information, but it's also similar to a Wonder Wall, which I'll be talking about later. And we're gonna use this year in my classroom. Um, and I'm really excited to adopt it. One is, um, another one is a tug of war where you have like kind of a line and then a question in the middle. And then um, kids think about the issue from different sides. Uh, we have a timeline that we've started and we are thinking about how much time has passed since um, the American Revolution started and now. And what about certain kids' birthdays? How, and we're also thinking about the math tie-in because right now we're doing larger numbers. And so adding and subtracting and using the standard algorithm and just getting kids to think about, you know, what happens you know, when the Greeks and Romans, which we started at the beginning of the year, we studied Greek mythology and talked about that, how much time passed between the time of the Greeks being kind of dominant in the world, and then the time of the American Revolution, and just getting kids to think about that. And that's a good kind of cross content connection. And also, it's super fun to think about making um, a compare and contrast bulletin board. Um, that was something that I hadn't done before, but it looks like it's really fun to put even just pictures up um, for kids to think about and make their own um, statements on stickies and put them up on the bulletin boards. Um, I did have, uh, I found a really great website called We Are Teachers. I like, if you don't follow We Are Teachers, they're terrific. They have lots of ideas that are really practical to help teachers have some like resources for their room. So they had a really great one on interactive bulletin boards that I put here. And wonder walls. And this was kind of where I wanted to open it up. If anybody wanted to share, if they've heard of wonder walls before, if they're using them in their classrooms, and if anybody has used these resources or heard of them, um, this would be a great time um, to share ideas and how you use them so we can learn from each other. Um, but I learned about Wonder Walls last year from our, um, our lit literacy interventionist. And I had never really considered doing something like this, but she had showed us one that she had made on just a trifold that you can get from the craft store. And you can make all kinds of different ones. You can make one that has just information about revolutionary leaders or battle sites or um, in the, the causes of the Revolutionary War. And um, it can be a way for kids also to ask questions so they can put sticky notes on the Wonder Wall and you can, and then that's their way of interacting with it. And you can bring those into class discussions. The great thing about having those on a trifold is that you can tuck them away when you're done with the unit and then have them store them away in a closet and use them for the next time you teach that unlike a regular bulletin board that you'd have to pull down. Um, and these were also some great resources to check out for more information um, and just how to use Wonder Walls as a source of inquiry, which is also really important when you want kids to be thinking about, well, did this battle have to happen? What were the causes of it? Or you know, what was the discussion that went behind creating the constitution? Um, and there's a blog here, madlylearning.com, and she talks about um, Wonder Walls that she uses, which is where this little picture here came from. Um, one of the things that we do in our district is to have lit circles for the American Revolution. 
but I always think that reading is always better when you do it with friends. And there are so many books out there now about the American Revolution. Um, there are many historical fiction stories, but there are also a lot of stories that um, are nonfiction that are for kids and really trying to tell new stories. Um, there was a great graphic novel that I had at the beginning, and it was a story of Crispus Attox, who was, for all intents and purposes, the first person who was killed in the American Revolution. And he was the son of a slave and a Native American. And he was, um, he, it was in Boston at the Boston Massacre. And he was kind of innocent. And hey, there's a statue of him now. And I wanted his story to be told in my classroom. So I found that really great graphic novel, but you can have book clubs for kids to explore the stories themselves and to talk about it with their friends. Uh, a great book to have to kind of get you started. It's a really fast read. Um, it might be a good one if you had to do a book group for work or you needed um, contact hours or something. Um, this reading new life into book clubs is a really, really great book. And it has like spells things out step by step, talks about what to do if there are problems and just thinking about um, how to really guide kids to think about the reading on their own. And there's also a podcast from Heinemann Publishers. And Lit Circles is a little different. It's something else to try as a book club. Lit Circles are similar to student-led book clubs but in Lit Circle, students have individual roles. Um, and so there was a post from the Literacy Learner blog that I included a link to there. So you could kind of get a sense if you haven't done either of those before to give them a try and to think about, you know, what, what might work better in your classroom and what are some things to just be aware of. And um, in my classroom, I try, I, I'm a kind of a book hoarder, it's really bad but I wanna have a lot of different titles for kids and I want to be able to reach kids at all different reading levels. And so I feel like it's really important to have as many books as I can. And when students have voice and choice about what they wanna discuss when it comes to reading, they become more curious. It improves their comprehension when they're having discussions about what the characters are doing and why they did it and what their traits are and what it led to. And it also increases student engagement. Um, one of the things that um, I try to do at least once a year is to have kids make games and just kind of go old school. And if you're in person, this is really great. I also have this um, game board as a PDF. So if you wanted to, I can share that also with Joe and he can maybe post it if it's possible. Um, if you wanted to share it electronically with students, if you're not in person. Um, but kids love making and playing games. Um, and so for this game, they're going to create their own game boards that talk about the um, road to the revolution, essentially. How do we get here? And um, so we have been talking about different events. And this is one student that she had just started and she drew Old North Church on the top, which... <laughs> I just was cheering for her when I saw it and I thought, oh, she gets it. She really is really into it and sees that that's a really important event about the midnight ride of Paul Revere. Um, so kids are thinking about as they do this, and we had a discussion today as we were working on them again, um, this same student, and we were talking about well, how to create the game. And she was saying, well, was the shot heard around the world, was that good or bad? And I kind of asked her what she meant. She said, well, was it a good thing or a bad thing? And I said, it depends on the perspective. And so inside I was silently cheering for her because I thought she gets it. She's grappling with this concept of, you know, which perspective is more important. And I said, but you know, you're, and you're the game maker. So you can decide what perspective is more important. Do you, you know, feel like it's more important to tell the story of the Patriots or to tell the story from the perspective of, you know, the, or the English crown? And um, she said, well, I don't know. I'll just have to think about it because she wanted to, if it was a positive thing, she wanted to have the shot heard around the world and then go ahead two spaces. So there's always that thinking of, you know, how can you make this fun? 
And for playing pieces in years past when we could share materials, kids were using model magic and they would make their own people. Um, but I'll show you a little bit later. Uh, kids can also take a piece of cardstock and they can draw a little Minuteman on them and then kind of make a little stand on the back and those work just as well. Or they can just get creative. Uh, one of the things that we had done a couple years ago that was super, super fun was uh, to have a design challenge. Um, and in this particular design challenge, um, the kids loved the story of Ethan Allen and the Green Mountain Boys taking Fort Ticonderoga. And also we had read a story, a picture book about um, Henry Knox and the cannons and how he brought them in the middle of winter from Fort Ticonderoga all the way to Boston. And they couldn't believe it um, that I think none of the cannons uh, didn't make it like that they, they brought all of the cannons and they know from their prior experience in Maine in a winter, what that's like. There were no snow shovel. Well, there were no like snow plows. There were no snowmobiles. There weren't big pickup trucks or there weren't giant caravans or tractor trailers. They had to bring them with horses and sleds and carrying them. And the kids were just really enthralled with this idea. So um, we had finished up the unit and we had some time left. And I just said, well, let's make it. And they said, well, you know, how can we do that? So we looked at pictures of Fort Ticonderoga and we divided up into groups and figured out in order to do it, what were the jobs that needed to happen? So I had some Lincoln logs, some wooden blocks and some cardboard boxes that the kids cut up. And I had this great paper that was like, um, looks like stone or brick. And so the kids put this together and this was one of the things I wanted to show. I'm gonna see if I can make my screen bigger. I don't think I can, but these little people that the kids drew, sorry about that. But here's one at the very bottom and there's a mad continental soldier. Um, so the student that made that is a student that doesn't typically care to write. It's very difficult for her, but she can draw. And so to do this for her, she just all of a sudden became kind of the superstar because she was making all of these people that were very expressive, that really told this story. Um, and as you can see, they really add a lot of character to it. So you can have kids, if we're thinking about the game board. You could have kids also make characters like that where they just like fold the piece of paper on the back. Um, but there was another, um, here's kind of a bigger picture. It took up my whole reading table is on the bottom, on the right, that's how big it was. So they made a path going in and they put stones from the playground and then they made the battlements as close as they could to what it really looked like. They even had a flag that they made um, for the Green Mountain Boys. And you can see that the Green Mountain Boys were hiding behind the stones with the flag and that they had their green jackets. And then of course there was a fire in the, in, um, the front, like kind of a bonfire in the front of Fort Ticonderoga. But um, so we didn't just stop with building this and you can tell this was pre-COVID, but what we called it was we called it a museum. and we asked kids, well, if you've been to a museum before, what is it like? And they said, well, you go around and you see the exhibits. Exactly. So here's your exhibit. So what if you don't know what you're looking at? What do you need? And they said, well, we need tour guides. Right. So what does a tour guide say? Well, we kind of have to write something up. Right. So they started thinking, well, we need to write like a little script. And how about if we have tour guides? And how about if we have people that give more information? And so they divide it up into groups and they task themselves with different activities and they led classes of from the other grades to come in and see their Fort Ticonderoga. They even made, and I couldn't, I looked everywhere to try to find the PDF version, but this is one I've saved because I loved it so much, is they even just made this, I'm hoping you guys can see it, but they made their own like tour guide pamphlet, Welcome to Fort Ticonderoga presented by Mrs. Connor's class. They were really, really proud of it. Um, so that was really fun. And I'm not sure if we'll be able to do that again this year or even something similar to it because we can't share materials, but 
if somebody can get creative or inspired by this and try something different, I would love to hear about it. Um, and these pages here are just, I have two pages of books and resources. Most of the books listed here are available either through Scholastic or through Amazon. So they're pretty easy to get. Um, and um, I'm trying to think, I have quite a few more that I didn't put here, but this was just a good way to start. And a lot of times, if you just are doing a search for a certain book, you know, you'll get three more that come up that are worth really pursuing. Um, some of the books like um, Dear America, The Winter of the Red Snow are really great for reading groups. And a reading level 34, um, it's a little bit below where they should be this time of year for fourth grade, but that might be great for third grade. Or if you have a lower reader, that would be more accessible. And sometimes it's not about making sure that the reading is challenging, that you just want it to be very enjoyable. So these were some things that I have, and I am all done with screen sharing. Um, and this was kind of my presentation. Does anybody have any questions or any thoughts or anything they want to share? I'd love to hear what everybody else is doing in their rooms or what they think might be doable. Becky or Lauren, anything you'd like to share about what you're doing or what's been inspired? Um, I love the uh, thought of the museum. I'm putting that in quotes since <laughs> you can't see what I'm doing. Um, <laughs> just because it's so great for kids to put kind of like a picture to a name or even along the lines of the Google Earth. Um, because it makes it more real to the child, child, which is probably why they were very inspired to do the museum. So I just thought that that was really awesome and so creative. I mean, I'm a very creative person, so I love the idea of that. And I have to say, I could not believe, I, I just couldn't believe what they did. This was all on their own. I was kind of trying to go around and put out fires and make sure everybody had what they needed and answer questions. And I came back and, you know, they would have giant sections of it finished. And so it was just this great learning experience and they really did have to work in teams. And there were times where things didn't go well, like they couldn't get the paper to wrap around the cardboard or the sides of the building kept falling down. And then they had to, to think of it in a different way and that was one of the things that I really, really loved is they had to have a growth mindset as well in order to pull this off. And they wanted so bad to make it look as cool as they could. So it was so motivating for them. Okay, it doesn't work. So we have to figure out what do we need to do? Exactly. And um, we live in a different time from back then. So it also... Uh, shows them like how hard it was or what materials they needed to uh, create ha buildings like the um, Lincoln logs. Uh, and yeah, like I said, and plus I remember back in fourth grade, I loved doing things like that. And once a kid starts to do something and then they, they're like, okay, guys, come on, you got this. Okay, we need you this, this, and this. Like it's as if it's a big, it just like flows like a river. <laughs> it really does. And that's the stuff like that makes, it makes it, that is for us as teachers too, right? Like we spent all year doing reading assessments or math assessments. And then all of a sudden we have this at the end of the year and it's like, yes, this was, this is it. This is why we do these things. You know, this is why we teach. This is why we're with kids. Exactly. And it shows you just how much they've learned and what they've gotten out of it. Cause it's them thinking, like you said, them growing their mind. Oh, it's so important. Do you have any, any thoughts about how, what kind of design challenge you might give your students? Um, so right now I'm actually in ed tech, but, um, 
I would love to work as like an actual, be an actual tea teacher. Uh, I went to University of Maine for that. So, um, but not the moment, but it's just great to get ideas. Um, there's also like plays that you could do. Uh, I remember I did a unit plan at, for university in one of my social classroom. Um, and it involved like the great American melting pot song from Schoolhouse Rock and a couple other songs. So getting them and then just like talking about the culture from the songs and what the songs represent. Right. Yep. Students also love music. <laughs> they, they do. And I still think those, the Schoolhouse Rock songs are just so catchy. And there are some really good ones out there for the American Revolution. There's No More Kings. And um, there's one too about, I'm just a bill. Um, it's but I'm that's, only a bill. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah, see, we remember. <laughs> and then um, I feel like there was another one too about how our country was founded. And I can't for the life of me remember it right now, but, um, and they're still just, they're so catchy and they're really great. So fourth grade has quite a time span to cover. Um, we, we're supposed to cover pretty much prehistory till post American revolution. And I started my kids, by the way, this is Becky Hollowell. We, I started my kids uh, thinking about the French Indian Wars before we even started the American Revolution because I wanted them to have that background of, of what was going on. And, and when we reached the end of just reading um, a beautiful book, I think it's by Linda Maestro. Um, I'm like, all right, so we, we've put a lot of money into this, who pays for it? And all the kids, we, we got up and we took took sides and all the kids decided the people living in the colonies ought to pay for the French and Indian War, which was perfect because then we started talking about how they were going to pay for it. And our bulletin board became interactive in that we, we had a Road to Revolution bulletin board. And yes. as we ended up doing, um, we, we covered certain events, you know, first we had, you know, the Stamp Act and then the Intolerable Act, the Boston Massacre. Different kids would take responsibility for defining that event, writing the date, and then illustrating it. And I have a class of amazing illustrators. So they were responsible for creating that board and they used it. So we, we covered, it was really interesting. We talked more about the causes of the American Revolution than the American Revolution itself. Um, so many great resources are available to, like there are interactive battle maps so you can see where the battles took place and who actually won the battles. Um, and again, because we don't have the time that we typically would during a regular school year, we, we hastened it. So the kids all picked a topic to write about for their American Revolution. They, and they had to cite sources at the end of it, which was amazing. And then they were allowed to select a different um, historical figure to write a biography about. The best part about that is we're reading Woods Runner by Gary Paulson throughout. And so they're, they're seeing the impact of a kiddo who's you know just a few years older than them and how his life was impacted by by the american revolution and then they're they're starting to see names and as they create biographies they're they're using what they've already read they're they're using what they've heard me read and they're like ben franklin well wait a minute he knew thomas jefferson and so they're they're connecting all of these different ideas which was it's just been an amazing project and and again as they read their biographies, they can't just read one source. They have to read more than one source. They have to write the title and take notes and make sure they write the page numbers of where they're finding their notes so that they can source it again when they're trying to quote their, their work. Um, I have been inspired by, by yours, uh, your presentation and using the museum. Um, we have a local historical society who is more than willing to help us talk about what it was like for Maine residents at that time. Um, and I think it would be an amazing project for each of the kids to create their own museum display. Oh, that'd be awesome. And then have them, um, have them be a docent for their own display. And there's a great resource through Scholastic from the I Survived the American Revolution. If you go in there, there's a American Revolutionary War Museum 
and they take you on a tour so you can actually see the primary sources. You can see different canvas bags that were used. We can talk about George Washington and you can also go to Mount Vernon um, and there's a virtual tour of Mount Vernon. Um, so you can see what George Washington's life was like. Um, the, the American Revolution is an amazing topic for these kids, but I, next year, I, I really think the idea of building up to the American Revolution and then um, I will be going, I, well, if we ever open up the Maine State Museum, we can go in there, take some photos so that the kids can actually see what a museum looks like in Maine. They right. can also um, take that virtual tour of <clears throat> the American Revolutionary War Museum through Scholastic so that they understand what a museum is supposed to be, create their own museum display, and then they can be their own docents. And hopefully we'll be able to have other kids come into our classrooms by then. What a great culminating project this would be. I know, yeah. And this was kind of one of those things that was like on the fly and I wanted to try it. And that's it, the best stuff right there. <laughs> you know? And they do far exceed your expectations, don't yeah. they? I did start a, a escape room for uh, Valley Forge where they had to figure out a way to get socks to George Washington's men. And, oh, awesome. Um, that was in, you know, incorporating as many math topics that we were coming up with and, and pulling in the language arts topics we'd been covering to make that escape room. But they, it was a, supposed to be a reward for class dojo points. They, and they decided to, uh, gosh, what did they do instead? Not that. <laughs> <laughs> they, they pick something else. And I'm like, oh, okay, we'll save that escape room for another time. <laughs> but that's great, though. I mean, and, and this just lends itself so well to, you know, cross content inclusion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. And so, there's go ahead. so many books, though. Um, I, I'm glad that you listed your book list and looks like I'll be making a donors choose grant um, to get more multiple copies. But Epic also has great biographies that the kids can get into. So oh, yeah. as they're researching their particular historic figure, they can go on to Epic and, and get a couple of different resources. So there's a print resource that they can, that I have for them, the who was George Washington, who was, it's the biography series with the big heads on the cover. Yep. Yeah. And they make so many now. Oh. They're just like cranking them out. I just love those. And I don't, this was one that I didn't quite get to put, but these are resource cards by Lakeshore, American oh, Revolution. Cool. And let me just pull one out. Um, but they have like the famous uh, engraving by Paul Revere of the um, Boston Massacre is one of them. Right. Um, is one of the cards. I can't put my hands on it now, but so there's famous people, there's famous events, the signing of the Declaration of Independence and what that is, but if you can see it. So this is a picture of the Boston Tea Party card yeah, and just kind of a, a little summary and a few questions. This cool. is also, you know, just really great if you just don't want kids to spend a ton of time on things, but just learning them, learning about them. And Charles Cornwallis. I mean, I just love that they're, these are not, people that you would read about in a um in like a who was right right and, yeah battles of lexington and concord which and i keep telling these these my class because i'm from maryland that it, it's so far away from all of this and to have all this history here mm -hmm. like they call it the birthplace or the cradle of of the american revolution and they said really <laughs> yes right. you guys are growing up in such a unique place um, so, and I don't, this was, this is really fun. And I don't know if they're doing it this year. I think they canceled it for last year, but, and it's coming right up. So usually the Saturday before Patriots day, um, Minuteman national park in Lexington, Massachusetts mm -hmm. has a reenactment of Parker's revenge. And so you can go and you can really see it happening. And it's it just, it gives you the shivers when you think about this is kind of what it was like. There are men dressed as Revolutionary War soldiers, the Minutemen, and there are some that are dressed as um, the British officers and they're on horseback and they're going through the woods. And it's just, it's really astonishing when you tell kids, this is here, you can see this, even Fort Western in Augusta, mm -hmm. you yeah. can see all of this. They realize it's so significant. 
Old Sturbridge Village also offers um, a Revolutionary War time, I think. I'm not sure they're doing it post-COVID or, or not, but it is an amazing experience. I, I took my own children to it. But something that if we can attend ourselves and take videotapes, you can always make a Nearpod of it. You know, to It's not like being there, but the closest thing. You Close can enough. Yeah. Well, and I did look at the, uh, through Google Earth, I looked at... Um, Minuteman National Park in Lexington and Concord, and it shows the Freedom Trail, and right. it shows the bridge with the landmarks, and so I think it really makes it, it makes it come alive for them when you talk about, well, they stood on the bridge, right. one group was on one side, and one group was the other, here's the bridge, and it, it's like, oh, it, it really is a thing, it's not just from a story, no. So, so can Joe give us some stipend money to go down and take our own pictures, <laughs> and, you know, create some, some Nearpod events? <laughs> I would love that. That'd be yeah, great. Fun. Just a, a, a professional development time. Well, and so one of my fourth graders, I, I never even realized this before, but here's one of the cards. Can you see it? Oh, it's Paul Revere. Yeah. Right. It's actually on the Sam Adams bottle. Right. <laughs> so one of my fourth graders said a couple years ago, Mrs. Connors, that's not Paul Revere. And I said, yes, it is. And they said, but he's on the Sam Adams bottle. And they were like outraged. What is Paul Revere doing on the Sam Adams bottle? And I said, that's a really good question. I'm going to go home and tell my dad. <laughs> you know, I think my favorite historical figure through that time didn't fight, but Ben Franklin, you know, you talk about a man of many talents you know, the kids could just go on and on with Benjamin Franklin. Right. And I think that um, Liberty's Kids is a really great video, a series that talks about everything he did, but they look at him and Liberty's Kids or they see pictures of him and they think he was the one that invented flippers, like swing flippers. <laughs> right. How could he have done that? I mean, all these things that yeah. they take for granted, like wood stoves. Yep. Right. Ben Franklin. <laughs> There was a thought in the chat. Somebody had talked about um, an inquiry question that they use with their units has to do with intended and unintended consequences, which really brings in the different perspectives on what people might have on that. Would uh, Stephanie and your two co-hosts at this point, Bethany and Lauren, would either of you like to share any thoughts or discussions around teaching the American Revolution to elementary students through the idea of intended and unintended consequences. Well, I think the Boston Tea Party is an awesome way to, to talk about that. Rather than intended and unintended consequences, we start with cause and effect, you know, and yes. we kept talking about how you'd have one thing would happen and then you know, England would instill attacks, the colonists would respond, and then England would respond to the colonists' responses. And we had a lot of side taking in, in our classroom where you'd stand up and you'd either go to the British side or the American side to decide, you know, who made, who made the right call here? Was it okay? And so that, that was a, a good way to start talking about perspectives. You know, what if you're the one in England who has to pay a tax on your windows to pay for this war that happened across an ocean? You know, don't you think maybe the colonists ought to pay something for it? Yeah, I think, I think that's great. And, and it's another way to really understand cause and effect under, and when you read nonfiction. I, it's really challenging when we teach nonfiction and we teach cause and effect before we get to this point and it's kind of a struggle for them. Like they understand if you drop an ice cream cone or it's hot outside and your ice cream cone melts, well, the sun caused the ice cream, the sun and the heat caused the ice cream cone to melt, but they really don't understand until they really think about and put themselves in the shoes of like a situation like that, the Boston Tea Party. And I think about, there's a book, um, it's a sequel to George Washington's Socks. Um, I can't remember the name of it, but there's a sequel and it talks about tarring and feathering and it really gets into that idea that there were the kids that go back into time again, but this time they're in Boston and the Sons of Liberty are going around in their tar and feathering Tories. And there was this one Tory family where the kids get separated and the girls go live with the Tory family who's very kind. 
and they didn't do anything to anybody except believe that the king was in the right because they were pa- they thought they were patriots but then the father got tarred and feathered and he died and i was reading it thinking oh my gosh this is fourth grade this is really heavy stuff but it's the truth you know like here are the sons of liberty making a stand and standing up but did they really have to hurt people do you know what i mean and i really think that when kids explore those kinds of issues that it it really becomes real to them and it's not just well you can sit behind a desk and make a decision about you know going to war no they're like costs they're human costs and just like should somebody in england in the colonies pay for windows for somebody in england no i mean there's always a cost for everything right the um Oh gosh, I lost my train of thought as I was listening to you. You have such great points. <laughs> but always, you know, humanizing these people, you know, and, and trying to help them understand and visualize, you know, put yourself in that farmhouse when Hessian soldiers are coming over and burning everything and killing your parents. You know, and when we read Woods Runner by Gary Paulson, I actually had, I was uncomfortable with it. Our literacy interventionist had, he strongly encouraged me to read it. And I did so with great trepidation um, and, and edited some parts of Woodrunner. But I mean, they're talking about getting scalped and, you know, just the gore. So I try to skip over enough of it, but really help these kids understand what if it were your parents that were kidnapped? What if you're that little girl who watches her, her mom and dad get attacked by Hessian soldiers and everything get burned and then they come after you? You know, it's just it's brutal. And I think sometimes we sanitize the American revolution. Hey, it's a fun thing to talk about. We won. Hooray. But, you know, it came at a huge price for a lot of people. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I agree. And I think it's true. And that's how we can use history to learn from, Mm -hmm. learn about the, the present, because all of those things that happen to people in war, like getting scalped and getting tarred and feathered by these people that are supposed to be heroes. Well, that's happening now. You know, it's happening when you hear about genocide in this country, or it's happening when you hear about refugees. And, and if they leave their children someplace and they go run away, I mean, how scared do you have to be to make that decision? Like, what choice did you have to make that you feel that leaving your child somewhere where you don't know anybody was better for them than what they had to go back home to? Do you know what I'm saying? Like, I just think that understanding how brutal war can be in a way at a young age in like an age appropriate way really makes conflict become real and helps them, I think, develop a sense of empathy and compassion for other people that are in situations that we can't even fathom. Right. Yeah. And well, and even like last year when we had the Black Lives Matter, like all of that going on. Like that's kind of in a way similar to back then, I guess. Like that's bringing the past to now, but still you could be like, this is in a way similar to what they went through. Right, they're making a stand just like the Patriots did. Yeah. Yeah. Or even going going through COVID. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. And yeah, well, and there's a really great, and I put this in the first chapter of the Maple story and the Moose platform. It was a Liberty's Kids episode where they talk about forming our government and what that was going to look like. And there, and Ben Franklin brought the ideas of Parliament in England, but then there were still like the Southern colonies and the Northern colonies didn't agree, and there were colonies that had more people had a greater population and some that didn't and so how did you reconcile those two and then we need a leader we want to have a king and they approached george washington and a couple things were happening and george washington that's when he said no and they have that in this um, episode of liberty's kids but then they also talk about um like well the southern states wanted to have slavery because they needed that free labor but the northern states were opposed to it But if the Northern states pushed, then the Southern states weren't gonna join the new country. And everything that they had sacrificed, that everybody had sacrificed, it wasn't gonna come together unless they made that 
that change unless they said, okay, we have to come back together as a nation. And I, I watched that with my daughter, who's 24 now, when she was little, and I didn't pick up on that until I was watching it for the Maple Project. And I thought, are we really still like debating this? This was, you know, almost 300 years ago, and we're still talking about this today. It just is so, it was just mind blowing, really, when you think about it. And I think the kids could make that connection. Mm -hmm. I agree. I think it's interesting when you, when you brought up the slavery, you talk about another way of, of having kids take different perspectives. You know, um, George Washington, great guy, great guy. Yeah, he was the leader of our country. I'm like, yeah, he also had slaves. And then all of a sudden it gets very quiet in the classroom and they're like, well, slavery is bad. I'm like, yeah, it is. <laughs> it is. And there was a book no. in a book group I went in, I had a couple years ago. He mm -hmm. went and he and Martha chased the escaped slave down. Right. So, so it begs the question of the kids, can a, is a person all good or all bad? It's, yeah. You know, how do you, how do you find your, how do you compromise that or how can you look at somebody and understand that it, it's not, nothing is ever as simple as all good or all bad. Exactly. Exactly. And just think, yeah. I mean, and when you think about the social studies standards, I mean, we're like, we're talking about nine and 10 year olds here <laughs> having this discussion and um, we're getting them ready, Joe, for the high school. We're getting them ready. <laughs> like, <laughs> thinking about these conversations that they're having. It's something that I'm trying to, you know, discuss with my 17 year old as he watches people break the protocols for COVID, you know, and it, are you all good or are you all bad? And, and, you know, what are people's levels of, of acceptance of what boundaries are, you know? Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Oh, I'm so glad you agreed, Becky and Lauren, to have a discussion with me. I feel like I've learned so much and it's so wonderful hearing about what other teachers are doing and what they're thinking and how they're approaching this in their classrooms. Thank you so much for sharing your experiences. Oh yeah, yeah. thanks for having us. Yeah, thank you. I, I mean, I learned a lot, which is always good. Well, the great news I'm happy to tell you is basically everybody who started the webinar is still here listening to the three of you brainstorm. So. <laughs> They all found value in it as well. <laughs> Great. So I, will, I will take this opportunity to thank you, uh, Becky and Lauren, for unofficially coming in to help co-host the second half with Stephanie, giving her a thought partner. Um, I will thank you again, Stephanie, for all of the awesomeness you're doing for social studies at the elementary level. Um, Stephanie will get a copy of the presentation sent to me, and I will get that posted. Um, but I just wanted to take a moment to say thank you to everybody, including Stephanie, for her time today. Yeah, thank you.